Welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Trial Network. We are covering four major trials going on across the country. We're going to get to all of those trials very soon. But first, a look at the other top crime stories going on that we're following. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A teen in Ohio who went missing six days after reportedly witnessing his father's brutal murder at the hands of his mother and her lover was found safe in Dayton. 15-year-old Jacob Caldwell was found with four adults in a home in Sugar Creek Township after authorities received a tip to his whereabouts. Jacob went missing a year ago after witnessing his mother, Tawny Caldwell, and her boyfriend, Sterling Roberts, murder his father, Robert Caldwell, in front of him and his younger siblings. Tawny Caldwell and Sterling Roberts are in jail facing murder charges, and the four adults Jacob was found with could face charges for allegedly hiding him. An unidentified man is claiming he had a 10-month-long sexual relationship with accused killer Chris Watts. Watts is accused of killing his wife Shannon and his two daughters, four-year-old Bella and three-year-old Celeste. The man claims Watts told him he was trapped in a loveless marriage. In April 2012, Watts released this video offering relationship advice when dealing with why marriages fail. Sometimes people, when the relationship starts to dissolve, repair is not an option and they want to get away and start new. When you want, when you act, when you want to go into repair, you need to analyze what went wrong and consider what ways of solving the problems. Before Watts was arrested, he begged the public for help finding his family. I just want them back. I just, I just want them to come back, and if, if they're not safe right now, that's what's, that's what's tearing me apart. Because if they are safe, they're coming back. But if they're not, this, this, this has got to stop. Like somebody has to come forward. Watts now faces five counts of first-degree murder and four other felony charges. Investigators in Texas are searching for a woman wearing broken wrist shackles and a T-shirt caught on surveillance camera ringing a doorbell of a home before running off. Other neighbors in the Sunrise Ranch area of Montgomery reportedly saw the woman ring several doorbells to no avail before fleeing. Other neighbors in the Sunrise Ranch area of Montgomery reportedly saw the woman ring several doorbells to no avail before fleeing. The identity and whereabouts of this woman remain a mystery and authorities are investigating the possible connection to a missing person. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Okay, this is just kind of a bizarre story. You have this video that went viral of this poor woman going up to people's doorbells, ringing them, and then her boyfriend um, is found dead by an apparent self-inflicted wound. I'm very pleased to welcome my guest for this afternoon, Francie Hakes, a former federal prosecutor and a current consultant. What do you make of this case that, that's going on in Texas right now? It's a bit of a mystery, but I think it stems from something very sad. It does, Rachel. It looks to me very much like there may have been violence going on between them. Clearly there was violence because someone's dead. But when you see the video of this woman, it looks very much like she's in restraints that have been broken. She's clearly not fully dressed. She's wandering the neighborhood. She looks like she might be pregnant. It's definitely a mystery I suspect we're going to learn a lot about as soon as we hear more facts. Francie, stay with me here. We have a big afternoon in store. We may take you live as soon as jury selection's over in this cold case that we're covering out of Iowa. I'm going to tell you more about that in a few minutes. But right now, I want to take you to another courtroom. Uh, and this is the case of Roy Oliver, former police officer. This is the trial that you've been watching with us, gavel to gavel. We uh, just got a verdict from this case, Roy Oliver, he was the one, you see his mugshot right there, facing murder charges for, according to prosecutors, opening fire on a young, unarmed black teenager. Take a listen to how the jurors decided his fate. And there you have it, guilty of murder. That is Roy Oliver, the former police officer in Texas, found guilty of killing that young boy, 15-year-old Jordan Edwards, a very tragic case. I want to bring in my panel this afternoon, a new guest as well as Francie was with us before we listened to some of uh, listened to that verdict. She joins me, and also a new guest we have here on the network, Jerry Gurley, criminal defense attorney. 
Guys, let's break this down. I, I do have one question for you all about this verdict. Um, you know, the jurors found Oliver not guilty of the lesser count of ag assault with a deadly weapon by a public servant. So answer me this, and maybe we'll start with Jerry here. How could he be found guilty of murder? Clearly, he murdered Mr. Edwards with a weapon if he was found not guilty of ag assault with a deadly weapon. I don't get it. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The fact is that sometimes when the jurors get back there, uh, they look at the law and then uh, they, they essentially start bargaining with each other. So perhaps there was a, the, the result of uh, agreement that we're going to find him guilty of something, so why don't we find him guilty of the, of the most serious crime that it was alleged here in charge here. I think perhaps that's what happened in this instance. Well, let's talk about the rarity of this, Francie, because first of all, you have an officer involving a uh, shooting case that gets charged, which in my experience covering these cases is quite rare. Then you have this happen in Texas, which we all know is a more conservative state. And from my understanding, this is the first time in Texas history that they've convicted a former police officer in a shooting like this. Well, Rachel, it's interesting because the public does give a lot of deference to law enforcement when it comes to shootings. They've never been in the position of making a split-second decision when someone's life's in danger. And so I think they show deference to police officers. I think this verdict is really very interesting because, as you said, it's completely inconsistent. And the law used to recognize that inconsistent verdicts often led to cases being overturned on appeal because they literally don't make any sense. It literally doesn't make any sense that you convict someone of killing this child with a gun and yet not also being guilty of committing aggravated assault with that same gun, which is part of the offense. That's okay, just so you brought it up, Francie. Let's talk about a possible appeal. From what I understand, uh, that's already in the works and that now the family has also filed a civil rights lawsuit uh, against, I believe, the police department as well as the officer. Since you, Jerry, are a civil rights attorney as well as a criminal defense attorney, I'm sure you've dealt with some cases like this. The fact that they now have a conviction, does that make a civil case easier to win? Well, yes and no. I mean, of course, the, the, the measure when you're in civil trial is... You're going to prove the case by the greater weight of the evidence or the preponderance of the evidence. So in one sense, uh, the proof is less, um, you know, in criminal trial is beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. Uh, it certainly strengthens uh, the, the possibility that a, a jury in a civil trial is going to find that there was liability as opposed to the, the officer being guilty. So, yes, uh, I've, I've actually filed these uh, type of uh, civil rights lawsuits, and, and it's an ideal situation to be going into a lawsuit with a conviction, a criminal conviction, on the part of the officer that was involved in the shooting. I'd like to chime in and also uh, to the point and speak to the point of that it is, this is a, a, a rarity. It is a very rare that, number one, when there are shootings, that police officers are charged. And secondly, if in those rare instances where police officers are actually charged with crimes, that they're convicted. So what, what happened here to, in this instance is rare, not just for Texas, but throughout the entire United States. And Jerry, stick with us uh, when we get into this next break, because I want us to take a really deep dive into this case. If you missed it, it was a fascinating one. And we're going to bring you all of the best testimony when we come back in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Alrighty, you were just listening to some of the testimony from Jer Charmaine Edwards, who is the stepmother of the victim in this case, obviously getting a bit emotional. This was done during the sentencing hearing. I'm joined by my guests for this afternoon, Jerry Gurley and Francie Hakes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. This is the sentencing phase of the trial. How much do these kind of statements weigh in on jurors' minds? Now, remember, this isn't the judge sentencing him. It's jurors. What do you think, Jerry? Well, I think it's vitally important. Otherwise, what we're talking about is uh, an individual who was 
a, a victim of a murder, but he's not a real human being. Th that line of questioning that, that was done by the prosecutor was brilliant to the extent that it made uh, the young man who uh, was murdered, it made him a human being. It, it showed that he had a life, uh, that he was loved, that he had a place uh, in his family, that he had a place in, in his community, and that he's not going to be there anymore, and that, that what has been left behind as a whole. So it made him a human being. And so I thought it was an excellent line of question. And But, Francie, I don't know if you got a chance to watch the whole sentencing. You probably didn't because it was quite lengthy. But during the course of this, and we're just showing you the highlights, the prosecution put on a parade of witnesses testifying about Jordan Edwards. And obviously, this is a very, very tragic situation. But we literally had a coach, all of these teachers. I mean, it went on and on and on. Is there a point where it becomes, wait a second here, you know, this is a court proceeding. Where do you draw the line on these kinds of um, witnesses? Well, Rachel, that's a great point. And, of course, the point of it is just what Jerry just said, and that is to humanize or make human the victim. You've got a defendant sitting in court. You've got a defendant who was a police officer. You've got a defendant who looks like a normal person and not some sort of slavering monster sitting in court. And so it's up to the prosecution to make sure that the jury cares about the victim. And that's the main way to do it is to bring in a lot of witnesses who knew him and can talk about him as a human being. Yeah, and I think there's no doubt that we all had great sympathy for this poor young man that lost his life and for his family. His father um, took the stand during the sentencing phase as well. I want to play a little bit of his testimony. Take a listen. Yeah. And we're going to continue with more of Jordan Edwards' testimony in just a few minutes. But for now, I want to bring in my panel again. Jerry Gurley, a criminal defense attorney out of Florida, and Francie Hakes, a former federal prosecutor and a consultant. You know, it's always difficult hearing from the family members um, of people that lost their lives, especially a teenager. And I'm sure, Francie, when you were a prosecutor, that was probably one of the more difficult things having to deal with the victim's families. But I want to talk specifically about the sentence. Um, I don't quite understand where they came up with the fine of 10K. Well, Rachel, I'm not sure what the exact law is in Texas with regards to fines, but there's generally a, a baseline that is a minimum fine and then a maximum fine. So I don't know what it was in this case. I think it's interesting the jury decided on the fine they decided on and on the sentence they decided on. Jurors deciding sentences is pretty rare, except in death penalty cases. Well, yeah, what do you think about this sentence, Jerry? Well, I think it's, it's remarkable that um, given as it's already been said, typically a jury is going to show great deference to law enforcement officers, and that's normally going to manifest itself in that they're going to come back with a not guilty. In those rare instances uh, around the country where there have been convictions, seemingly what's gone along with that consistently is a small amount of time in jail or prison, if any. So I think it's pretty substantial that this jury not only comes back with a conviction, but on top of that, there's a 15-year uh, sentence, and I think the range was from five years uh, to uh, 99 years. So 15 years is a serious statement. And on top of that, a $10,000 fine, I think the jury's making a statement that they did not believe that the officer was justified in any way, shape, or form in using deadly force. Well, I still don't get that one bit about why they didn't convict him of aggravated assault. But we're going to get to more of this sentencing because I think it's so important that you hear from the families of these victims more from uh, Jordan Edwards' family when we return. All right. Uh, just so difficult to listen to. That was Odell Edwards, Jordan Edwards' father. Um, he's the unarmed teenager that was killed by Roy Oliver recounting the moments when he received that phone call that his little boy had been shot. It's so difficult to hear. I'm joined by my panel, Jerry Gurley and Francie Hakes. After hearing testimony like that, Jerry, it's hard not for the, for the jurors not to want to impose, you know, the maximum here. Yes. A couple of thoughts coming to mind. 
Number one, um, the testimony, his entire testimony, his entire testimony makes him relatable. Makes him relatable. I mean, it's not just that um, they have their sympathy there, but that kind of testimony uh, reaches the juror at a different level. This is something that I could have had happened to me. I like wings, too. I like to hang out. I tell my sons that I love them. So it makes them very relatable, and that's important as well. What also strikes me uh, is the, what the police department did in this instance of mischaracterizing or demonizing these young men as drug dealers is, is a typical approach to demonize or to to make them out to be some type of monsters because obviously if they're monsters then the jury does not have to care about them at the same level that they have to care about ordinary citizens and I'm glad that the jury in this instance was able to look beyond those typical mischaracterizations, those stereotypical images that are often portrayed of African-American males, and look at the facts. And look at the fact that the testimony that was offered, the reports that were done, did not line up with the videos. The justification was not there to use deadly force. And I'm thankful in this instance that the jury came to the right conclusion. All right. Thank you so much, Sherry. Stick with me for a few more minutes. I want to play now some other testimony from a witness by the name of Rosalinda Medina. And she talks about, uh, this is during the sentencing phase again, and she talks about another incident that happened with Roy Oliver. This is different than the officer involved shooting. This is when she claims he was particularly combative when she had called the police for help. Take a listen to some of her testimony. Okay, so Ms. Medina was testifying in, testifying, excuse me, in Roy Oliver's sentencing phase. And she's talking about another incident completely unrelated to this shooting for which she was convicted of. Francie, help me understand here, help our viewers understand why this testimony was allowed. Because, of course, it really has nothing to do with the incident at hand. Well, Rachel, this is just like aggravation evidence in a death penalty sentencing. They are making sure that the jury knows who this, because the jury is the one making the decision on sentencing. Ordinarily, this would, in other states, this would just be the judge's decision, and all of this evidence would be put before the judge so that they could tell the judge or the jury exactly who this defendant is and why they should sentence him very severely. And, and Jerry, what do you make of this testimony? Well... Again, I agree with what uh, counsel has said previously. I would say, I would though, in, say addition in addition to addition. that, this, this brings up the fact that there are certain officers um, who have repeated patterns of being aggressive, using too much force. And it appears, unfortunately, in this instance, this particular officer is one of those. Now, normally, uh, a jury would not be the one, as this mentioned, sentencing and certainly a jury would not hear this during the course of the trial, because as you indicated, it's not relevant. But it is important to let the jury know that this person didn't just uh, mess up and this is he's otherwise been a model uh, Citizen, officer. Citizen, so that he has a history of this. Okay, Jerry, we have some breaking news to announce um, regarding the trial that we're covering out of um, Iowa, and we'll bring you that in just a, a few minutes. Uh, also, we're going to go into more of this Roy Oliver case here, more testimony from the sentencing, a lot going on here on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, folks, we've got some breaking news in the trial that we are going to take you live to just as soon as we have a feed out of Iowa. That is the Stanley Liggins murder trial. That's the cold case. And I just got word from my producer that the Liggins jury has been selected. It is five men, ten women. Openings expected soon. We'll take you to that courtroom just as soon as we have that feed. Just in case you're just joining us, this is the case, a cold case murder. Uh, happened back in the early 90s. Stanley Liggins is accused of killing Jennifer Ann Lewis, a nine-year-old little girl. Um, and he's accused of raping, strangling her, and putting her in a plastic bag and burning her remains near an elementary school. He was convicted, get this, folks, 
twice, in 1993 and in 1995. However, his conviction was overthrown because the defense found uh, 77 reports that hadn't been turned over. In addition, a key witness was a paid police informant, and that never came out during the trial. Let's bring my panel in. This is an interesting one, guys. I want to see how this case unfolds third time it's going to trial. Jerry, what do you make of, of some of what's happened here, specifically as it relates to what appears to be some pretty egregious prosecutorial misconduct? Well, it's my understanding that the first time the case was um, overturned, it was by the uh, Iowa Supreme Court. And secondly, secondly it was overturned by the, uh, the appellate court. So um, when the state uh, withholds exculpatory evidence, uh, that's misconduct, and it's grounds for a, a mistrial or a, a redo or a appeal every single time. So I think that the Supreme Court and the appellate court got it right um, in terms of how this case plays out this time. It depends on the evidence that's presented, but it's right under the circumstances as we know them for him to have a third trial. Francie, I've been looking into this case, reading everything I can. I'm no expert. I haven't listened to the first two Kate trials, so I you know, don't know all of the details. But it looks like it's a pretty thin case to me in terms of hard evidence linking Stanley Liggins to the murder of this nine-year-old girl. Rachel, it does look like a difficult case to prove at this point. And can I just say, my very first job as a baby assistant DA, my chief assistant DA told me something that stayed with me my whole career. If you can't win putting all your cards on the table, then you shouldn't be playing. Yep. And so I had an open file discovery policy my entire career, regardless of what the law said, the agencies wanted, my office wanted. Defense attorneys and judges alike knew they could come look at my file and I would open it up to them at any time. This is the number one reason cases get overturned. And I find withholding exculpatory evidence to be inexcusable and shocking. And look where we are and what is it going to do when we're seeking justice for this little girl that now has to wait and is now delayed and may be denied. I 100 percent agree, Jerry, and I don't know if you'd agree with this. We talk all about uh, policeman misconduct a lot. It's that's great that it's come out. People are more aware of this. But prosecutorial misconduct is also somewhat rampant. I'm not saying it happens all the time. And I feel like the public's not quite as aware of this. Yeah, they aren't. And, and there's really no mechanism for them to, to be aware unless they're in the courtroom. Certainly the media is not covering that. No. Uh, sexy as, as well you, you know with the thing with prosecutorial misconduct it's like paperwork right it's not like you know with police you have these police dash cam videos where you can see the egregious conduct when you're dealing with prosecutorial misconduct it's simply the prosecutor not turning over a file it's not as sexy it's not as glamorous but it ends it can end in the wrong person being put behind bars well, I think what happens sometimes, I would say sometimes, a lot of times, it's its human beings get locked in on winning and losing. And they lose sight of the fact that the most important consideration is the mm -hmm. pursuit of justice. And so if, if that can remain at all times in the forefront of all individuals, that, that's from the law enforcement officer on the streets to the prosecutor to the judge, that all of us, and that includes the defense attorney, we're all should be aiming toward the same thing, which is the, the, the pursuit of justice, then you're, the judgment is not going to get clouded and we're not going to be so overly concerned about winning. Now, I would commend Frances to the extent that she had this open file policy, but I can tell you that in my hundreds of encounters with prosecutors here in, in the Central Florida area, that has not been the case. Okay, let's let's continue our conversation about this in just a few minutes. But now I want to turn back to that case that we've been covering out of Texas. Roy Oliver, who is the officer convicted of murdering an unarmed teenager during his sentencing, folks, his wife took the stand. What does she have to say about this guy? Why did he end up a murderer? Take a listen. Obviously, it's very sad there to see the wife of Roy Oliver. Uh, you know, she is she's really a victim in all of this, too. But the question is, does this give you sympathy for Roy Oliver, the man? Jerry, what do you think? Oh, I'm not so certain that it does. I mean, but what, what, what does the defense attorney want to have to 
have something that can cause the jury to have some compassion. I don't know that this testimony gets the job done. I understand why they are. Francie? Well, I think defense attorneys do uh, a really good job humanizing their clients for juries. And I think this testimony was emotionally powerful. You could see that she loves her husband. She's upset that he's been convicted and she thinks he's a good man. It's understandable. Defendants accused of the most horrific crimes almost always have at least a few people sitting on their side of the courtroom who are willing to say that they're not the monster they're being portrayed. So what else, what choice do they have? Francie, Jerry, we're about to take you uh, to that sentencing, and we're going to find out what the jurors decided. We've given you a little bit of a sneak peek, but we'll play you the full sentencing from the jurors, the recommendation, when we come back right after this break. Stay with us. All right, there you have it, 15 years and a 10K fine. That was the maximum penalty. I'm here with my guest panel again, Jerry Gurley, who's a criminal defense attorney out of Florida, and our regular guest that we love having here on the network as well, Francie Hakes. I, I guess it's not a complete surprise, that sentence, but like you mentioned before, Jerry, they had an option of going up to 99 years, this is a murder case. Is 15 years on the lighter lighter side, Jerry? I mean, it's all relative. Yes, it's on the lighter side. But and I look at that that sentence in light of what typically happens in a law enforcement murder, alleged murder trial. First of all, they typically do not happen. But when they do happen, uh, it's typically a not guilty. And then lastly, if there is a guilty, it's very light punishment. So I'm looking at it relative to all the things that we've discussed previously, the fact that the jury wants to give the law enforcement officer, and right, rightfully so, every uh, benefit of the doubt. But having done that and having looked at the evidence in this case, they, they felt that it was necessary to give a significant amount of time in prison. When you're going to be in prison for over a decade, that is a significant amount of time in prison. So I think, again, looking at everything, that it is substantial. All right. You know, this is a case that really captured the nation. We had many people here on in our chat rooms and around the country focused on this trial because, as we've said before, it's rare for a police officer to be indicted. It's even rarer for a police officer to be convicted. And it's even rarer for a police officer to be sent to jail for something like this, especially when he was on duty. So we're going to continue following that case, any developments that happen, and bring them to you. But in the meantime, I want to ta take a look at some of the other top cases going on across the country. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Investigators in Philadelphia are looking for a wrench-wielding madman who was caught on camera attacking a Wendy's employee and threatening to break a window with a socket wrench. The suspect can be seen on camera becoming upset after having issues placing his order at a Wendy's drive-thru. The suspect couldn't have it his way and lost his cool, banging on the drive-thru window before returning to his car to grab a socket wrench. The unidentified Hamburglar is still at large. Authorities in Pennsylvania arrested a suspect in the murder of a former Playboy model found dead in her apartment last week. 30-year-old Jonathan Wesley Harris was arrested after investigators received a tip after releasing this surveillance footage of the suspect. Harris is accused of killing 36-year-old Christina Carlin Kraft, who was found dead in her condo in Ardmore, the victim of an apparent strangulation. The one-time Playboy Playmate's body was discovered after police conducted a welfare check. Harris faces charges of first, second, and third degree murder, as well as robbery and theft charges. Authorities have reportedly found the woman seen in this now viral video ringing the doorbell of a home while wearing broken wrist shackles and a t-shirt. Investigators will not release the 32-year-old woman's name since she is considered a family violence victim. Residents in the Sunrise Ranch area of Montgomery reportedly saw the woman ring several doorbells to no avail before fleeing. Authorities say the woman's boyfriend was found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound inside his home. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. So that last story out of Texas that you just heard, so bizarre, Franzi Hakes. What do you make of it? 
bizarre. You know, what it looks like is that this woman was being held against her will, broke away, and ran out into the neighborhood for help. I mean, I just can't think of any other explanation for what we're seeing on that Ring video. Yeah, it certainly was bizarre. I hope, I, I believe this woman is now safe, so that's the good news. But I can guarantee you, just looking at this, she doesn't look well. I think there's more to the story there, and I hope police get to the bottom of this. Very, very tragic. Okay, let's now turn to another case. As I said, we're covering four big cases here on the network, and one of them is involving a female perp. Her name is Angela Kilgore, and I'm going to say it. I think she might be one of the dumbest criminals we followed so far here on the Law and Crime Network. She is accused, and, and, and unfortunately, it's not funny because what she is accused of doing led to someone's death. Uh, a a 72-year-old man, his name was Jerry Ridge, she's accused of stabbing and shooting him and burning his body. He was the owner of a pawn shop. Let's take a listen to some of the prosecution's opening statements in that trial. All right, guys, a lot to unpack here in this Angela Kilgore case. She goes to a pawn shop, which apparently she was going to rob, and she wears purple gloves for everyone to see and then leaves them at the crime scene. Jerry, what do you make of this? Stupidity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What I make of this, <laughs> from a, a criminal defense attorney point of view, is how did this end up being a trial? Thank you. That's what I was wondering, too. She must have been, you know, she couldn't get any kind of deal, and she just said, I'll take my, I'll roll the dice here. I mean, I, I t often tell my, my clients uh, when we're contemplating trial, it, trials like trials telling the like story, story. And, and any good story, there's a bad guy and there's a good guy. Uh, if you're the bad guy, we don't need to go to trial. And clearly, the, the documentary evidence and the physical evidence, and just her, her just inane tactics, uh, caused her clearly to come across to a jury as being someone that is clearly guilty. I don't know why there's a trial. So, do we have her mugshot? I think we have her mugshot because I want to explain to you something about Miss Angela Kilgore. See, this isn't the first time she's been in trouble with the law, Francie. There she is. Uh, she's been in trouble with the law before because she robbed a bank uh, and apparently she asked for a half a million dollars. Guys, and get this, the, the smart teller in the bank said, sure, you can have that money, but if you want that money, we'll write a check out to you, but you first have to fill out this loan application. I kid you not, she started to fill out the loan application. Yeah, that, hence my original statement, uh, stupidity. Um, I don't understand what's going on in this case, but I think obviously the jury got it right um, in and, terms of And Francie, I heard you talking. Maybe we're having some audio issues with you. I, I saw you talking, but I didn't hear you talking. But we're, don't worry, though. We'll hear more from you because we're going to take another deep dive into this case. Uh, it's a fascinating one. Why did it go to trial? I have no idea, but it did, and now you get to see what happened. So in just a few minutes, we're going to take a quick break, and you'll hear more from the prosecution's opening statements. Stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network. Hey, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and this is Legal News You Can Use. Today's topic, you get injured on the job. Now what do you do? Number one. Get first aid or medical treatment immediately. I want to make sure you're okay. Except in emergencies, you may have to go to a provider authorized by the Workers' Compensation Board or your employer. Second, notify your employer as soon as possible of all of your injuries, including any previous injuries you may have, no matter how small you may think they are. This is important because if you wait on this or are not transparent, you not only risk losing your right to receive workers' comp, but if this goes to court, your case could be thrown out for fraud. After notifying, then complete and file a workers' comp form and send to the Workers' Compensation Board. You need that money, my friends. Finally, when you're able, go back to work. Can't stress this enough because you place future compensation, benefits, and even your job in jeopardy. Claiming that you lost the ability to earn a living is not an easy thing to prove in court. Now you may be saying, Jesse, what about suing? I got injured, someone should pay. Well, before you go all off with their heads on me, Determine if the injury was caused by any of the following. A defective product, a toxic substance, 
the intentional or negligent act of your employer or a third party, or if your employer doesn't carry workers' comp insurance. If any of the following are true, you may have a case. But as always, consult with an attorney first. And in some injury cases, you may need multiple attorneys. Go to lawandcrime.com for more legal news you can use. Hey everyone, this is Jesse Weber. Here at the Long Crime Network, we are dedicated to bringing you the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. Goodbye, Leary. May God bless your dark, broken soul. We've covered everything from the Aaron Hernandez murder trial to the Harvey Weinstein sexual abuse scandal. Get ready, because we go live into the courtroom as the drama unfolds. For the record, go to hell. This is Law and Crime. Okay, just a brief update on that trial that we're bringing you in Iowa. We're going to take you there live in about, oh, I'd say about an hour and 15 minutes. That's the Stanley Liggins trial. He's accused of killing a young nine-year-old girl, Jennifer Ann Lewis. He was convicted twice of raping this young girl, strangling her and putting her in a plastic bag and then burning her remains. Tragic case. But the question in this, is there really enough evidence to link this man to the crime? We're going to take you live there for opening statements in about an hour or so when uh, we get that feed. In the meantime, this other case that we were covering before break, and that is the Kilgore case, Angela Kilgore. She's the perp who uh, is accused of robbing and murdering a pawn shop owner. Let's take a listen to more of the prosecution's opening statements. Take a listen a person of interest and she was interviewed by law enforcement that night they talked to her she came down to Whitwell PD voluntarily and I'll direct your attention to the boots that she's wearing she's wearing brown boots and you'll see a better picture later but the boots are important ladies and gentlemen and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute they also photographed her hands and Ms. Kilgore had cuts on this hand, as well as there is a laceration on her other hand that you can see there. And one of the witnesses will tell you, I believe Darren Rogers from the raceway, that when she came in there after these events had occurred, that she was bandaged and had been bleeding. She was not taken into custody at that time. Officers also took some photographs of the defendant's truck. And it's the front and the back of the truck. And what you see and what the arrows are pointing to is she has a Confederate license plate on the front and she has some decals on the back of the truck. She was taken into custody two days later at Foster Falls. The officers located her and they took her into custody at that point. And this is her truck at Foster Falls two days later and you'll notice where the arrows are, the decals or whatever they were in the back window are gone, and also the Confederate flag license plate is no longer on the truck. So she has changed since the crime occurred the appearance of her truck somewhat. The officers in working the truck found some items. And the truck ultimately went to the crime lab and we'll talk about that. But the first thing I wanna talk about is this bag. And that bag, as you can see, has firearms on top of it. They're handguns. And the officers later laid those out on the table. And I believe there's 15 or 16 guns um, that were recovered from, that, from the truck. Now, three of those guns went to the crime lab because 
they had what the officers referred to as RBS, which is a red blood stain. Don't know if it's blood, that's why it's sent to the crime lab, but it appeared to have blood, so they sent those three of the guns went to the crime lab for analysis. Mr. Ridge was a federal firearms, had a federal firearms license, and they obtained the federal firearms record book uh, from the pawn shop, and, and these are lists of the various guns that Mr. Ridge had that he has to maintain for his federal firearms license. Each gun that's contained in the photograph that you just saw that was obtained from her truck in that bag came, is reflected in the federal firearms license book. <clears throat> All 15 or 16 guns are shown in this book at various various places. They're not all together, but they're spread out, and, and Detective Johnson went through it and matched the serial numbers to the guns at the pawn shop. There were some other items in the truck that officers recovered, and these were not recovered actually until the, uh, they went to the crime lab. And you'll notice there's a shirt here, and that shirt becomes important in a minute. Um, Lisa Burgey, who's the DNA scientist, worked the truck and she actually obtained these items. And what she did is she laid out on a table the items taken from the front seat of the Ranger pickup. And this particular shirt is, will be of interest, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so you got all this evidence against Miss Angela Kilgore. You're the defense attorney, Francie Hakes. Where do you take the defense? Because we're going we're gonna to go to the defense's openings, but l let me see what you think. Rachel, I didn't know we were playing stump the former prosecutor this time. <laughs> Where do you go with this defense? I don't know. I mean, I truly don't know because she's so dumb that she's like, and it isn't funny. I mean, and I don't mean to make light of the death of the pawn shop owner, but she's so dumb that she left so much evidence. There are so many things tying her to the pawn shop. I think Jerry said earlier, why is this case going to trial? I call this a roll the dice case, Jerry, where there's really nothing to lose by just rolling the dice and hoping there's an appellate error later. You know, but it's the type of thing you're her defense attorney and you're just saying, gosh, I actually have to stand up before these jurors and put on a defense. And here's here. I'll give you a little clue into what her defense is. It wasn't me. Let's take a listen to some of that. Ay, 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 ay. That's what I've got to say so far about the defense's opening statement. Jerry, weigh in. <laughs> From the very beginning, and, and, and this is even before you get to the opening statement, uh, you know, the judge will tell the jury that uh, whatever the attorney says is not evidence. You must rely only on the evidence, and the attorney's statement is not evidence. But the reality of trial is that if you're defense attorney is bumbling through the opening statement in that manner, the jury's uh, forming an opinion about you uh, via your defense attorney. What I found um, concerning about that opening statement was that it seemed to suggest that the defense had a burden and that they were going to be able to meet the burden. One of the things that I say very um, often in my opening statement is that we do not have a burden here, ladies and gentlemen. It is the state of Florida that has the burden, and we're going to show you how they failed to meet that burden. And I, I didn't hear any of that. Jerry, money. Jerry, you haven't been on law and crime long enough. You're tiptoeing around it. Francie, it sucked. The opening <laughs> statement was terrible. That was a terrible opening statement, Rachel. And it was obvious he didn't even believe what he was saying. <laughs> I mean, talk about bumbling through it. I think he's bumbling through it because he doesn't buy it himself. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, it, it's it, you have to convince the jurors that you as the attorney believe in what you're telling them. If it doesn't look like you believe it, then how are the how are the jurors possibly going to believe it? But we're going to see where this this goes, where the defense takes this case. As I said, it it is an interesting one. Uh, it is a tragic one because it did end in the death of a 72 year old victim, Jerry Ridge. When we come back, more inside the case of Angela Kilgore. And also, I want to tell you more about a case we're going to take you live to in probably about an hour, a fascinating cold case. All that when we return in just a few minutes. Stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network. Okay, so here's what's kind of interesting about this case. 
Apparently, at first, we heard Angela Kilgore, who is on trial in this case, uh, for the murder, stabbing and sh shooting of the 72-year-old victim, Jerry Ridge, who owned that pawn shop. Apparently, she at first wanted to take the stand in her own defense. Ah, uh, Jerry, um, <laughs> what do you make of that? Uh, now, it turned out she didn't in this case, but she gave indications early on, and so did her defense attorney, that she was going to tell her story. Well, thankfully, um, the defense attorney was at least competent to the extent that he managed to dissuade her from doing that. The general rule is that we don't put the uh, defense of the defendant, rather, on the stand unless there is an absolute necessity uh, that there's evidence that you need to get out, and the only way you can get that evidence out is through uh, the defendant. An example of that would be if, if someone is claiming self-defense. The only one that can testify to the defendant's state of mind is the defendant. But other than that, uh, it's fraught with danger, and in, in, for the majority of the time, my advice is going to be we don't need you on the stand, we don't want you on the stand. Well, thank goodness, Ashley, or uh, Francie, that she did not take the stand, uh, because I don't think that would have gone over so well. I don't think she would have helped herself. She would have had to withstand probably withering cross-examination about the wounds, the gloves that probably have her DNA in it, her truck at the scene, the receipts, the guns, uh, the removal of the decals, obviously attempt to disguise her car after the crime. I, I don't I see how she could have helped herself at all. All right, so let's talk about some more of this evidence and take a listen to Mark Wilson. He's with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. And Special Investigation, and he is talking about some of the evidence that they have collected against Ms. Kilgore. Take a listen. Yikes, all sorts of, uh, sorry, we just showed you a courtroom there for a second. That was a tease. We'll take you there. But um, there's all sorts of forensic evidence uh, linking Angela Kilgore to the scene here. And so again, I'm joined by my panel, the fabulous um, Jerry Gurley and Francie Hakes. They've been with me all afternoon. Um, we're about to play the verdict here. I, I don't think it's going to be a huge shocker. I'll, I'll preface it with that. But, you know, as jurors are listening to some of this testimony, is it resonating? Is this enough uh, to convict her? Jerry? Absolutely. Uh, Francie, that was a quick answer. Absolutely. Francie? Oh, oh, I think so. You've got blood all over gloves where you've got his blood, her blood, a cut on the glove that matches a cut on her hand, his blood on boots that were recovered from her. Yeah, I think this is an easy answer for the jury. All right. Like we said, why did this go to trial? There's many reasons, and one of them could have been that the state was unwilling to give her any kind of deal, so she decided, well, what the heck? I'm just going to go and see what happens at trial. All right. So here is Judgment Day. The verdict is in. Take a listen to what the jurors decided. All right, there you have it. Guilty as charged. Angela Kilgore is going away for a long time. Francie, not particularly uh, unexpected, but it's always good to hear the verdict from the, those jurors. It really is. It certainly isn't unexpected. It sounds like there was a mountain of evidence against Angela Kilgore, and it sounds like this crime was actually particularly brutal. She seems yes. stupid, and we've talked a little bit about that, but it was a brutal crime, stabbing, shooting, followed by burning the evidence. She's an angry, dangerous woman. It, yeah, it certainly was, and it just makes you wonder kind of l bigger picture here. You know, we're talking about how she wasn't the smartest, et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't, while she had robbed a bake before, it didn't look like she had a particularly violent history, and to do something like this and to change MOs is a bit strange, Jerry. It is, and, and there could be a myriad of reasons why she could have been desperate for money. Who knows? Um, but... At the end of the day, the jury got it right. I think that the evidence was overwhelming. You say mountain, I say overwhelming, <laughs> convincing, whatever. Again, I, I go back to why was there a trial in the first place? But I think also, you're probably right. In this instance, the, the state may have not wanted to make an offer. They may have wanted to make an example of this person. At any rate, um, this outcome is not a shocker. 
And, and as I mentioned, this is just one of the four big trials that we're following across the country. The other one we're about to take you live in, and I'd say about a half an hour, is the Stanley Liggins trial. This is happening in Iowa, and it's regarding this man who is now facing a murder trial for the third time for the brutal killing and rape of a nine-year-old little girl. It's a cold case now um, that's being retried oh, after evidence came forward that the prosecution had failed to turn over to the defense. Um, it's going to be an interesting case, and as soon as we get a live feed and get those opening statements, we will bring them to you. In the meantime, another big case that we've been following is that case of Shana Hubers in northern Kentucky. She is the young woman accused of murdering her a prominent attorney boyfriend. Was it murder or self-defense? We're going to hear from her own words as she tried to convince the jurors that she did it because she was in scared. She was scared for her life. We'll take you there shortly. Stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network.